All right. So just to do an explanation while people are filtering in, um, okay, what's up? Belmar, Rich. Uh, we're gonna basically just go, I'm gonna do ship equipment first. So it's gonna be modules. Uh, then we'll go to the rigs. And once we do the rigs, then we will do, uh, hmm, do we do ammo or drones first? I think drones after that, then ammo. Uh, and then we will do ships. We'll hit subsystems at the end of modules. We'll do, we'll do ships and when we do ships, we'll like look at common fits and things like this. And, um, uh, and at, at the very end, I guess we'll do structures because possibly by then more structures will be out. Fafnix, thank you for the sub, my friend. Uh, so yeah, so I suppose we should maybe get started here. So I think we just go down the list, right? Like we can try to jump around and stuff. It's probably more logical to like jump around and things, but um, we're going to go through everything and I'm just going to cut it up on YouTube by these things. So uh, we'll just be covering the normal stuff. Uh, generally faction stuff is going to be, is going to have better stats kind of across the board. Generally it'll be easier to fit. Uh, and it'll have just better stats. Um, Dead Space stuff listed here as complex will sometimes be easier to fit. Uh, generally have even better stats than faction. Occasionally it'll be easier to fit than faction. Occasionally uh, it won't be. Sometimes I think it's even harder to fit than T2, depending on the variations. Um, but yeah, just keep in mind uh, faction. Like if you run out of fitting space or you want to get a little extra stats, faction is a way to do it to pay money extra money for extra stuff or extra fitting. For instance, the, the common eagle fit right now, kind of you need a faction afterburner or some faction extenders in order to get it all to fit properly. Um, but we can look at that later on. So we'll go to normal here. So for drones, uh, at the top of the list and the most common is the drone damage amplifier. Uh, if you are in Pypha, generally you can just right click and go to module stats. It's not as pretty as in game. Uh, description will just do the same description as you get in game. And then the attributes is kind of where you're at for the stats that you're getting. Yeah, pith prop mods and boosters are harder to fit than T2. So you'll get fittings in here as well. Um, but the main thing we want to look at is what does this module do? So it's a low slot. Um, let's just uh, get let's just get uh, something that can do drones. So we'll just get an Ishtar. Just create a new Ishtar fit here. Um, go mods. So your drone damage amplifier simply uh, upgrades your drone damage. This is basically like Weave stuff, but for Eve. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, so these are kind of the most common thing that you see on drone ships because they just boost the damage. So the equivalent of the magnetic field stabilizer, uh, the gyro stabilizer, the ballistic control system for those different weapon systems. But for drones, they improve the damage that you get. Uh, and yeah, it's as simple as that. So if we go to our Ishtar here and we grab some drones, let's just go with the ogres. And we just add a flight of ogres here to the old Ishtar. Boom. So you can see uh, when you activate the drones here in Pypha, you'll see you get the bandwidth fills up. Uh, and your drone bay fills up a little bit. Uh, and then your damage is listed right here, 475 DPS. We're just using an all five uh, character for the time being. You can import your own characters in to get accurate numbers. Uh, but then if we go to our drone damage amplifier right here, and you can drag it or you can just double click. We'll add one and you see we go up to 573. And if you add more, you can see your damage continues to go up. There's a stacking penalty in Eve. I don't know off the top of my head, what the numbers are. Uh, I think the first one is 100, second one is like 40%, and it kind of gets done from there. Uh, let me see here. Uh, got a link for this app. Uh, yeah, if uh, I should be able to post a link, so I'm technically a mod. Uh, here is, oops, that's not what I want. 
uh, well, here's the link. Uh, it says no links are allowed, I guess, by regular folks, but maybe that's not allowed. Did I break the rules? In any case, there's Pipe. It's open source, not officially supported by CCP. Uh, one of the most common uh, programs. Uh, but yeah, so basically, most people will say four is kind of like the most you want to put on a ship. Because like we see 797 DPS here, and you add the fifth one, and you get like not even 20 more DPS. The sixth one is is five DPS. So like, <laughs> if you're an exceptional individual, then maybe you throw six of anything, any particular thing on a ship. But uh, five is like the fifth one is where you'll get like still some benefit. Um, but most people top out at four. If you're trying to make like a useful fit even even less than that if you're trying to make like a combat fit um, but on like uh, ratting boats where all you care about is damage 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 uh, four or even five occasionally sometimes people will put but yeah you can see it just boosts your damage to your drones uh, an interesting thing to take note of is that this is a damage percent not a rate of fire which means that it also increases your volley uh, so you can see as we toggle this on and off, our volley number over here uh, on the right will increase. So for ships that get a a bonus to drone damage as opposed to like rate of fire tracking, etc. Like the Gila, for instance, uh, increasing the damage actually also increases the volley, which is uh, very important. I have a question. Does important characters work after the API change? I guess I'll find out tomorrow. I'm not sure. I don't remember seeing any ESI hooks in there, so... Uh, who knows? Uh, but you can at least create, uh, create. Uh, you can manually create characters, so that might continue to work. But I'm not sure about that. Uh, so DDAs, they increase damage. There's a compact version, which is just it does increases more damage than the tech one. Actually, we can we can do this. So tech one here, tech or compact tech two. So tech one, uh, 27 CPU. And you can see here 15%, compact 25 CPU, 17%, tech 2 30 CPU, and 20.5%. So if you can't use tech 2, the compact is just better. Um, the only reason you would use a tech 1 over a compact is if you run out of these because they can't be created, they drop from rats. The difference between volley and DPS, uh, well, your DPS is, you know, how much damage you do every second over an average, whereas your volley is the how much damage you do on your initial shot or on each shot that you take. Uh, so, you know, basically, like, you can see this, you're firing about once every four seconds with these drones. Um, so your initial, your volley is your initial amount of damage on each cycle of the weapon. Well, latest update, Pipha says it supports ESI. Well, there you go. All right, let's keep moving. Drone link augmenters. These are high slots. Uh, you got tech ones. You got tech twos. Tech two is a little harder to uh, to fit. Uh, and as with all modules, tech two is going to uh, have higher requirements. You can see here, drone avionics five is your limit there. Whereas on this one, it's drone avionics three. So easier to use. Uh, these do something very simple. They increase your uh, drone control range. So. If we delete these for a second, and you see your drone control range listed down here in Pipa, 85 kilometers by default on the Ishtar. If we add a Tech 1 drone link augmenter, it goes up 105 kilometers. If you look in the stats, you will see it says right here, increases it by 20,000 meters, that's 20 kilometers. So 85, 105, 85, 105. Pop another one on there, and you'll note that these uh, modules are not subject to stacking penalties. So you get 20 per. Uh, the, the general limit on drone link augmenters you're going to find is that uh, uh, the CPU, the fitting, uh, 50 CPU is quite a lot for most ships. Uh, tech 2 is 5 more CPU, more skill requirement, and as you can see, it does uh, 24 cam instead of 25, or instead of 20. So. And you'll see these most often on uh, ratting ships and occasionally uh, when, you know, like there are Ferox fits that use them because like what else are you going to put in the high, extra utility high of a Ferox? So, uh, but they're most common on like VNIs and whatever else and occasionally on uh, Fer or like Ishtars in combat and stuff, especially if you're trying to kite from far away. 
uh, with uh, like an MWD armor Ishtar, um, you're probably going to want these uh, because they increase the range at which you're able to give your drones commands. So it's important. Uh, and that also applies if someone else is controlling your drones through the assign method. Um, in the game, you can assign your drones to someone else, and then when that person uses an offensive module, uh, your drones will attack. Uh, that is still limited by your personal drone control range. So even if they uh, have a higher drone control range, uh, your drones won't follow their commands if they're outside of that range for your personal ship. Make a late fit for the Praxis. Oof, I haven't even looked at that thing yet. It's got like, what, 50 high slots, 50 medium slots, and 50 low slots? Something like that. All right, so moving on, we have drone navigation computers. These are mid slots, uh, and what they do, if we go to attributes, increase your drone's maximum velocity uh, and the speed of fighters as well. So uh, basically, you're looking here at the uh, fighters, and you can see this is the this is the speed listed down here. And as we toggle it off. 2.06k, toggle it on, 2.58k, and this is uh, with the micro warp drives on. Drones actually do have like lots of little systems. Um, you'll notice that drones like will suddenly pick up a bunch of speed and then they will slow down. They have a micro warp drive that they will turn on and off automatically as they're trying to um, uh, get into their optimal range. Uh, which you can see right here listed for the ogres 5.25 optimal five kilometer fall off so they'll try to get in that optimal range uh, and to do that they'll turn their micro warps on which does bloom their sig makes them more vulnerable to bombs etc just like a regular micro warp drive does uh, but the drone navigation computer basically just makes them faster um, you'll see this occasionally on uh, you know regular drone boats the vni ishtar uh, etc uh, dominic's uh, but you will often also see it on carriers especially as a refit option uh, so someone will have like uh, three drone nav computer twos in there uh, or even four in some cases in there uh, or even more than that but i uh, wouldn't um, when they are moving fighters across a long distance so if they're trying to you know sit on a citadel a thousand kilometers away from something else that they want to shoot at they can just refit off their buddies to these drone nav computers and make their drones or fighters in the case of a carrier go a whole lot faster and then once the fighters are over to where they need to be they'll just refit back to something else but yeah so drone navigation computers they increase the speed of your drones and fighters uh we'll skip the uh, we can cover the fighter support unit but essentially uh if we add one of these uh we have to make a carrier so we'll just make a it hug your fit here uh doo -doo. We'll add a fighter support unit. These are only fittable on uh, carriers and I think super carriers as well. <laughs> I should have looked that up before I played. Uh, but yes, fit carriers and super carriers. Uh, and they essentially just increase your uh, rate of fire, shields, shield recharge, and velocity to your fighters. Um, they don't increase your uh, your damage which means that they won't help a carrier like one shot crabs uh, or uh, rats rather. So fitting more of these or fitting higher tech levels of these is not going to help you, um, you know, like be able to volley battleships better. Um, they help your overall DPS. So uh they also do help your fighters be a little tankier and a little faster, so they can help uh, in PvE, but they're generally better in PvP where you can take advantage of the uh, of the rate of fire bonus to just increase your DPS. Uh, so we have tech 1, we have a compact one, and we have a tech 2. Uh, you can see here, tech 2 is 6% across the board as opposed to 5%. If you look here, this is tech 1, 5% uh compact is what 5.5 yeah so you ba you're only getting an extra one percent um for nearly triple the cost at least according to these estimates that's why you don't really see a lot of tech two fighter support oh excuse me fighter support units uh unless someone is rolling in that dough yeah yeah commodore came in because they can use uh, fighters as well those are faction uh faction capitals 
But yeah, most of the time you'll end up seeing either uh, FSU ones or compacts for fitting. Um, yeah, tech twos generally are for people who are like trying to spend every amount of ISK that they possibly can. Yes, I am recording this locally and it will go up on uh, my YouTube later on. Thought you paid 225 mil. It's possible. They're very expensive compared to tech one. Um, yeah, so those are just carrier and super carriers. If you're not flying caps, you don't have to worry about them. Uh, the next two uh, modules we're going to go over are essentially drone versions of the tracking computer and tracking enhancer, which are tur turret uh, mods that we'll look at a little bit later on here. So the omnidirectional tracking enhancer is a low slot mod. It doesn't use any scripts or anything. And if we look at it, it provides uh, range and tracking speed for drones and range, explosion radius, and explosion velocity of all fighter weapons. You might be asking yourself, why are the why are they different stats for fighters and drones? And that's because fighters actually don't use the tracking um, calculations. Even the fighters' um, turret weapons are calculated on a uh, application like a missile. So, comparing explosion radius and explosion velocity to the velocity and the signature radius of the target. Um, we'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> it's a more in-depth discussion uh, that we can, I can make a, a video specifically for like, how does weapon application work? But basically it just means that the same modules work on fighters and drones, despite fighters and drones using different damage calculations. Uh, so if we look at how much they help, uh, this is tech one, 4.4% for the fighter bonuses. And then we have 6.7 optimal percent and 13.4 fall off percent for the uh, for the drone here. So if we toggle this guy on and off, and you look at the stats here: 5.6 optimal, 5.67 fall off, and oh wait, so that's with it off, yeah. So 5.2 and 5, and then we hit it, and it goes up, and it goes up. You can actually see that it does affect the gives the fall off a larger <laughs> larger bonus than the optimal. Um, and then you've got tech one, you've got compact, and you've got tech two. And it's essentially the same thing. Tech one is standard, compact has better stats and is easier to fit, so you almost always want to use it uh, if it's not obscenely expensive, which in this case it doesn't look like it is, um, you know, compared to the tech one. And then your tech two has higher requirements, uh, harder to fit, but more bonuses across the board. So if we just say like, you know, 5.78. Uh, optimal six fall off for the tech two and the tech one is 5.6 5.67 so uh, and then uh, this the bonuses go across the band let me just check chat real quick uh yes i did talk about wanting to do this um let's see let's see you guys are just uh talking to each other that's fine make sure if you have any uh if you have any questions for me that you do at Avern in the chat so that I see it. Uh, otherwise, I may miss it. Uh, so the final one here in the drone upgrades category is the omnidirectional tracking link. Uh, it is very similar to the, uh, and I should I should say that everything that we've covered so far have been passive modules. These are all passive until we get to the omnidirectional tracking link. This is a mid slot, and it accepts scripts. So you can place it here. It affects the same statistics as the tracking enhancer, but it's stronger. It's an active module, so it takes a little tiny bit of capacitor, very small amount of capacitor. You can see, um, you know, 0.133 per cycle, very, very small. Uh, but it, uh, it is more powerful as a mid slot. Generally your mid slot buff modules are going to be more powerful than your low slot because mid slots are at a higher premium a lot of the time uh, and they're active and they can take scripts. So if you don't have a script in it and you turn on, it will affect uh, basically all the stats that we already talked about. Tracking speed, uh, fall off optimal, and then your damage application statistics on the fighters. Uh, but if we right click here and we put in a script, let's say we want to do optimal range script, then you can see it gives us the bonus here to 5.78 to six kilometers. Uh, but then if we change it to tracking speed, we lose it. We go back down to our default uh, 
stats here for optimal and falloff. But this little column right here in PyFed, this little weird little data core looking icon here, generally just like a utility uh, column that will show different things depending on what you're looking at. And in this particular case, it's the tracking speed. If you hover over it, it will, t will tell you what it is. So you can see that when we have the tracking speed script in it, we get a big bonus to tracking speed. And then if we remove the tracking, or if we remove the script, we get a little to optimal follow up and a little bit of tra to tracking. So it's essentially the same sort of thing as the omnidirectional tracking enhancer, but since it's a mid slot, it can use scripts, it's more powerful. Um, so if you care more about tracking or more about optimal range and so on, you can swap between the two. Uh, you can overheat it. Uh, as well because it is an optimal or it is a an active so if we right click here we overheat we get even more bonuses uh, and then you have the standard tech one you have a compact and then you have an enduring which means it uses less capacitor see here much less um, and then we have uh, the tech two all right uh, so people are just talking to each other that's cool Um, I, well, wait, that's, I'll allow this message, but I disagree. There is plenty of solo and small gang to do an EVE. Not as much as there used to be, I don't think, but plenty. Uh, so yeah, so that covers the drone modules, uh, and there aren't that many of them. They affect, uh, you know, the DDAs, uh, affect fighters and, um, and drones, drone link augmenters affect just regular drones, drone navigation computers affect fighters and drones, as well as uh, these fighter support units only affect fighters, and then the tracking enhancers and links affect both fighters and drones. But I explain the tracking, I'll do a separate video uh, where I talk about how damage applies um, for sure. So keep an eye on the YouTube and follow my stream over at uh, twitch.tv slash and you should be able to catch that. Um, but yeah, that would take it would take a lot of time to do right now in the middle of this. Uh, all right, so moving on, we'll go to electronic warfare. Oh, here's the first big one. Here we go. So, uh, oh, we should do like a I should do like a cut. And we're back. Now I'm going to talk about electronic warfare modules. Uh, these include your standard uh, E-War, and people will just say E-War to refer to ECM, uh, sensor damps, tracking disruptors, even target panniers. But this uh, group also includes things like webs, scrams, uh, and um, like projected ECCM, uh, ECCM itself. So we'll go over it. Tell everyone why burst chambers are cancer. Uh, uh, let's see here. So burst jammer or burst projectors. These are super capital weapons. They basically allow you to, uh, send an AOE of the ECM or the, uh, the electronic warfare into an area. So you target it using super capital Q click targeting. Really not important for a new player to know about. Just know that if you see like this weird beacon in space, it says, projected whatever whatever there's going to be like a sphere of something around there either ecm in the area energy neutralization in the area which is where it removes your capacitor from your ship sensor dampening where it makes your ship uh, lock more lock targets more slowly and reduces your max targeting range uh, stasis webification burst projector where it applies a, a velocity debuff to your ship target illumination which is a target painter aoe makes your ship's signature radius uh, expand. Warp disruption burst projector, which is a warp nullification bubble. So inside the bubble, you can't warp. And weapon disruption burst projector, which uh, messes with your ability to apply damage using turrets and missiles. Do these see much use? Um, yes, mostly the bubbles. But um, the others a bit, not as not in a crazy way so far. Uh, since these were added to the game, most fights with super caps on field have been between caps and, and other caps, so it's really not worth really not worth doing it. Um, because uh, triage, which are the repair capitals, and dreadnoughts, which are like the heavy damage capitals, 
are immune to all this stuff anyway. Uh, once they're in their like uh, stationary exceptional uh, s status triage or siege, as it were. Uh, yeah, they're also only usable in null sec. Uh, aren't some of these okay in low sec? I'm pretty sure you can do these in low sec, can't you? Where is it? There's a thing in here where it says... Um, yeah, I don't know for sure. Someone who's used a bunch of these can probably say for sure. Pretty sure uh, that some of this stuff can be used in certain situations. Obviously, the bubbles uh, can only be used in null sec, uh, but some of this stuff I think can be used in low, and, and even I think the nuke can be used in high on a citadel at least, because obviously caps can't super caps can't go in a high sec. Um, you can use them all in low sec. Apart from the bubble one, yeah, that's what I thought. And then in high sec, I think, um, oh, maybe not actually, because it's like crazy AOE, isn't it? I thought, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not going to comment on it because I don't know for sure. But yeah, suffice to say, if you're new to the game, you probably won't run into these. And if you do, you'll probably get, you'll probably just get owned by them and, and someone will tell you what happened. Um, but yeah, they start with a little beacon in space uh, and then they go around that beacon in a, uh, in a uh, in a sphere. Miles, what's up, dude? Said it also have stand-up versions. Yeah. Uh, ECM bursts. Uh, these are if you're ever looking for these in game and you're using the search tool, remember burst jammer, burst jammer. If you type ECM burst, you won't find it. Um, they're called burst jammers now. Uh, essentially, this is a ECM, which is electronic countermeasures, it's designed to break a target's lock. In the case of burst jammers, they don't prevent you from locking. They just break any lock that you currently have. So if you have a target locked and you get hit by a burst jammer, you lose your target lock, but you're not prevented from relocking that target back up. Uh, tech one here, if we look on it, there are some attributes that are important here. Uh, the first is a pretty decent activation cost here. Uh, you've got, you know, 240 gigajoules is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, activation time duration, this is like the cycle time, so you can only use them once every 30 seconds. Uh, you can only fit one of these per ship, so fitting a bunch of them and like uh, staggering the cycles doesn't work. Uh, the radius here, you can see 10,000 meters, so this is a radius, which means anything within 10,000 of your ship. So at 20,000 uh, 20, meters, that's 20 kilometer sphere around your ship, uh, will be hit by one of these. And if we look at... Like the Tech 2, you can see the radius is a little bit bigger, 12,000. So if we look here, uh, the things that are important to note are the jammer strengths. So when you're hit by ECM, either by this burst jammer or by targeted ECM, you are uh, there's essentially a die roll that happens based on the sensor strength of your ship, which on like our example Ishtar shows right over here. Um, versus the strength of the jammer, and the particular, the flavor of the jammer strength that you're being hit by. Burst jammers are simple because they uh, apply the same amount of bursts or jammer strength to all four ship types. You can see here Gravimetric, that's your Kaldari ships. Magnetometric, that's your Galente ships. Ladar, that's your Mimitar ships. And Radar, that's your Mar ships. Uh, even the faction ships will have a particular kind of uh, of sensor strength. So if we look up something like, let's say, Macarial. Uh, what is this? Oop, this is an old fit. So if we go to the Macarial, you'll see this is a this is a, a faction ship. You can tell that it's got bonuses from Mimitar and Galente. Um, but if you look over the sensor, it's Ladar. Lidar. And most of the time you can tell which flavor of sensor strength a ship is by looking at the background of the portrait. You see here, uh, it's a little small, but there's like the red background like a Mimitar ship would have. And that's how you can most of the time tell uh, this has got Mimitar sensors. So if you were trying to burst jam or if you were trying to jam it with a targeted ECM where you have to kind of pick the flavor, uh, then you would, you know, go for Mimitar in that one. But on the burst jammer itself, it applies the same strength to each flavor uh, of ECM Jammer uh, and it just pops. It's very strong in terms of uh, a single module Jammer strength that hits all types uh, of sensors for the same strength. Uh, but it's A, very short range, uh, B, it has a long cycle time, 
uh, and see it doesn't prevent your target from locking so basically you generally only use it um, as a way to either troll a fleet because you're an individual who just wants to break everyone's lock uh, or you have like a small fleet of ships with these and you're kind of like staggering them and warping in and bursting and warping out and so on um, because they they do apply to every target in the radius regardless if they're friendly or not um, or if you're just trying to make an escape like a lot of ships um, like if you have like a cargo ship you you could have I know when I do blockade runners I throw an ECM burst on there just as a uh, kind of last ditch uh, escape attempt you know you align out to a target you hit your burst jammer and if that lock breaks you just warp away um, but you don't see a ton of them because mainly because they don't prevent targets from locking after they go off and uh, because uh, they hit, they'll hit your friends as well uh, and yeah so you have tech one you have scoped where uh, it increases the range a bit I can see 11 kilometers compared to 10 with the standard one we have enduring which has the see the range of the tech one but the capacitor use is a little bit better Remember, scoped is range, enduring is capacitor use, and compact is fitting. You can see in this column here, the tech one and the two other metas are 30 CPU, and the compact is 24 CPU. And then the tech two, just uh, it's harder to fit, but it's better uh, in pretty much every way, aside from, you know, for instance, the uh, capacitor use. If we look here, uh, activation costs 192 gigajoules on the enduring and 288 on the tech 2 but other than that the range the uh, burst strength and the and the, and the uh, although not the fitting will be uh, will be improved so those don't see a ton of use but they are good uh, at, at sort of their particular little uh, niche so we go on to ECM uh, ECMs uh, basically you have a couple of different things here so you have the targeted jammers gravimetric Lidar, magnetometric, and radar. And if we look at, for instance, the gravimetric, go to the attributes here, you can see it has a um, optimal range of 24,000 meters by default. It has a fall off range as well, so you still can be effective outside of that, but your jam strength will fall off in that range uh, and, and so on, um, much like a turret. Um, but the thing to take a look at here is the jammer strength. So we have a 3 on the gravimetric strength, because this is a gravimetric ECM, and then only 1 on the other flavors here, which means that you can jam non-Kaldari ships with the blue jams, but it's going to be a, a lot uh, lower of a percent chance of success. And let's see here. So if you if you overheat these... Uh, the jams get stronger. If you, if we go and look at the metas, you have scoped, which is going to have a longer range, compact, easier to fit, enduring uses less CPU, and then their tech two has a longer range, stronger jams, but takes more CPU and more capacitor to use. Uh, the same goes for lidar. Uh, they'll have the extra strength uh, against the lidar uh, signatures, so good at jamming Mimitar, but only uh, you know a third of that at jamming everything else and that goes across the board so that's why when you know what you're going to be trying to jam you want to pick the color of jam that uh, corresponds with the kind of ship that you're trying to jam out uh, and if someone says they get like an off race jam or or uh, something like that that means that you know like oh I, I i was in a bit of trouble and i used my blue jam on a galente ship but it, but the jam went off which is like all right you rolled pretty good on that uh, on that die roll. Uh, but there is also another class of uh, jammers called multispectral, where if we look at the stats on those, so for instance, let's take a let's take a Tech 2 radar jammer. This is uh, good at jamming Amar ships. And we look at the radar strength, it is 3.6. And this is uh, just by default. Your, your ship, ship bonuses are going to make that number higher, however. Uh, and then if we go to multispectral, and we look, it's 2.4, but it is the same across the board. So if you are only fitting, uh, if you're fitting, you know, at least four jams, then 
the general consensus is to what they call rainbow fit. So like if we go to a Griffin here and we, yeah, that's fine. And we, let's see, we have five mid slots. So normal Griffin would be like a micro warp drive and then you would just do one of this, one of the LADAR, one of the magnetometric, and one of the radars. And what that means is that, you know, depending on what ships are on field, if you want to try to jam four different ships, you can try to pick uh, the ones that go to the one that you're jamming. Uh, but like, let's say you're doing a ship, let's say this is some other ship, and you only want to fit one or two uh, jammers and you have absolutely no clue what you're going to be trying to jam, that's where multispectral can be useful. So if you just have one on there, uh, you know, it's not quite as good at any particular ship type to jam, but it's like middle of the road at all of them. Don't get sucked into the trap of like saying, well, I want to be ready for anything and just fill your griffin up with a bunch of multispectrals because um, while those are they're easier to use because you don't have to think about who it is you're trying to jam, they're lower strength, so you're going to have less jam successful overall. Uh, and uh, one thing I should have mentioned is that with these targeted ECM modules that are not AOE, they're targeted to lock the target and, and apply the module. For the duration of the jam, uh, the enemy won't be able to even lock new targets. Uh, so uh, that is that is why they're generally better uh, in terms of like if you're going to have a bunch of frigates with E-War on them uh, or with ECM on them, you'd rather have targeted ECM than the bursts. Wouldn't four times the multi-spectrum give you more total jamming strength per race? Mm, maybe. Um, can we do napkin math? Uh, what was it? 2.4? Two point four nine point six three point six plus three times one. Uh, yeah. In terms of total, I guess I I I guess so. Um, now the diminishing returns is only if you're stacking multiple. Although I don't even think it works that way. Um, I I guess pr probably you could make that argument. You could definitely make that argument as like in terms of like a holistic look at the jamming strength um but personally for me uh i would rather have the rainbow fit because if it's like oh crap there's a hugan i really need to jam i really need to jam this hugan i would rather i would rather have a single overheated red jam like the highest possible roll uh strength to to jam um, than having a bunch of multispectrals. Um, yeah, I think it, I think heating uh, when you're overheating modules, it also comes into play because, like, yeah, technically you could overheat all the multispectrals and use them all, um, but then you're also like heating up your entire mid rack and possibly burning some of those modules out. Um, so, yeah, you can make arguments both way. I think. Uh, but especially, they're really definitely useful when you only have one, like one ECM slot and you don't know what you're going to be facing and you just have it in there. Um, in a fleet fight, it would be rare, but yeah, you don't want to put jams on the same target. Uh, so the last in this electronic countermeasures section is the signal distortion amplifier. If we look in here, it's a very simple, it's a low slot mod and it uh, increases your range and strength with ECM. Very simple. Increases the strength of the jams, increases the range of the, the optimal and the fall off range. Um, so you know your your standard Griffin fit is going to be look something like just two of these guys, and then you know a bunch of jammers. Uh, and you can see if we toggle this on and off, this is the jam strength, uh, and then this is the uh, optimal and fall off. So that's about it with ECM. Uh, ECM is like water does the people's least favorite you were that exists in the game because it's kind of like i think it's the only um it's the only e-war as far as i'm aware that uses any kind of die roll all the others are just based on static stats and so on so people get really uh 
upset when like something that has a very very small chance of jamming actually ends up jamming them like a single tech one ecm drone is a very low chance of jamming a lot of ships but it's a die it's a die roll so occasionally it happens um so yeah uh next in the list is interdiction sphere launchers these are i mean these are you they're under the electronic warfare but these are ships that uh or these are launchers that uh, ships called interdictors use to launch the what we call the bubbles which are the uh, warp uh, disruption spheres or warp disruption probes i think no, interdiction oh good i can't well inter interdiction yeah they're some sort of what are they probes warp disrupt probes so uh, but the, that's the discussion on those is better for when we're covering ships and we go over the interdictors because there's going to be a lot to talk about when we do that. But suffice to say for now, these are launchers that go on interdictors that launch the bubbles. All right. Uh, we have... Wait. This, <laughs> this doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there used to be something called ECCM that was its own module group. Um, oh yeah, you're right, Air. The uh, multispectral also has a shorter range, so that's another reason that you wouldn't want to use them if you can help it. Um, like if we if we open this real quick and we go, here's a Tech 2 regular and a Tech 2 multispectral, you can see the range is actually significantly shorter, especially if you end up um, putting a bunch of stuff on the ship that makes the you know like even if we if we do a crazier ship that's going to affect the statistics even more and then we fill it with um and we fill it with uh something or other uh let's see here so we'll put a multispectral on here no are we going to not do it am i missing something why isn't this going Scoprion, Scorpion. Uh, let's see here. Okay, my Pipha broken. Hello. Oh wait, yeah, you're right. I'm clicking the wrong thing. Sorry, guys. All right, so we go. Let's do a bunch of lidars, uh, and then a bunch of multispectrals. And then we'll fill this thing up with signal distortion amplifiers. And then we'll also get the rigs. What are the rigs called? Dis particle dispersion projectors, I think. Yes. All right. So, like, if we're going for our insane max range uh, no tank ECM Scorpion, then the difference becomes really apparent 118 versus 176 kilometers. Um, so let's see if you have four rainbow and you apply a 35% chance, uh, with four multi-specs, you'll have a 37% chance. Yeah. So Asher's got it. All right. You're, technically your jam strength is like slightly better in a, if you look at it, like through a holistic, if you were like a status statistician who didn't have any context. Um, but he's there with the four racial jams, you can apply well to four different ships and um and the range is a, is a huge differentiator as well so yeah this is the first of many times where i will like completely forget uh something such as the range difference uh, and the other thing is you can also remember you can heat these guys to get their uh because they're active mid slot module you can heat them to get more range at them so all right so i think that about covers it for ecm how do i like that chair chair is great dude um you can pm me on discord if you want to know like what model it is you were not aware of this. So much for your decade. Dude, there's going to be plenty of situations during this whole series where I'm like, where I say the wrong thing or I say something uh, or I miss something completely. So don't worry. I'm right there with you. Uh, all right. So where were we? All right. So we finished ECM for now. ECCM used to be a module uh, that you could use either locally on your own ship or you could... Um, project it almost like a repairer onto another ship to increase their sensor strength, which makes them harder to jam. Nowadays, they've folded that functionality into sensor boosters and remote sensor boosters. So when we cover sensor boosters over in 
uh, I think probably the next category here uh, we will we'll go over those uh, but yeah so this is just a vestigial category I don't even know why it's still in here it's cute though it makes me remember the days it's almost like humans get stuff wrong sometimes I know right all right, so rote sensor dampeners. These are the uh, most obnoxious, eh, I mean, mm, it's hard to say. One of the two most obnoxious things that people generally don't think are unfair. Uh, so what a remote sensor dampener does, let's uh, let's get us a solicitus. Oh, we got one right here. Uh, basically, uh, these are mid slot modules. They're active, you can overheat them. Overheating them increases the Excuse me, power of the effect. The effect being, what? Where is it? Module stats. The effect being uh, targeting a range and scan resolution penalties. So you apply penalties to your opponent's ships. Uh, so it reduces their max targeting range and or reduces their scan resolution. Scan resolution is uh, their stat that is calculated based on the size of the ship they're targeting to how long it takes them to target that ship. So uh, if we look over here uh, on this uh, Celestis, for instance, scan resolution here is 363 millimeters. If you hover over this in Python, it'll give you like an estimation as to uh, how long it takes you to lock something based on the little numbers to the right are the uh, signature radius of the ships. So you can see with the carrier, it's very quick because it's got a very large SIG. With a pod, it's very slow because it's got a very small one. So the bigger your ship or the smaller the enemy ship, uh, the longer your lock time is going to be. Uh, and using these sensor dampeners, you can make that even worse for the enemy that you're applying it to. Uh, these are, again, active mid slot modules. These do take scripts. So if we go into the charge here, we can actually flavor these in a particular way. So uh, by default, they do basically like even percentages to both of those two stats, but we can say we want to hit, like let's say we're uh, looking at logistics and we want to make the logistics very slow to lock up their allies to provide repairs. You could switch these all to scan resolution and then instead of getting a 25% to both, they, uh, they don't affect targeting range, but they do double the effect uh, to scan resolution. So if we were to say uh, apply, like let's say there were two Celestuses and one of them wanted to sensor damp the other, we can see what kind of effect that would have. This is going to be pretty brutal. So we remember uh, that right now it's, it would take us estimated uh, three and a half, three and a half, three point six seconds to lock up a cruiser. Now if this Celestis was using all of its dampeners with the scan resolutions on, and we and we look, oh god. It would take 20.4 seconds instead. Uh, these are subject to stacking penalties, so you're better to spread them out across uh, a bunch of enemy ships. But even with one of these things, just one sensor dampener, remember that was three and a half seconds, and it doubles it. Um, and then, you know, if you were doing something like, uh, a lot of the times, like in the Alliance tournament, for instance, you'll have two dampening or jamming ships that will try to damp or jam uh, the other ones before so like if you had a Celestis on both sides of an alliance tournament team you know 12 pilots each or 10 i'm not sure if they changed it um and it was the start of the match uh and you but you guys both went uh whoa, you both went targeting range dampening uh and you just went ham on each other you even overheated the things uh the targeting range for this ship by default is 93.8 kilometers with max skills and this and this setup here, if you got damped, it's down, it's down to 10 kilometers. You're not locking up anything. Uh, so is it more effective to use two uh, sensor res and two targeting range or four? Uh, yes, that is the case. Because of the way the stacking penalties work, you want to script them. Uh, if you are using them on the same, if you're using them all on the same target, you want to script them. You want to do two and two as opposed to doing all four unscripted. As far as I'm aware, as far as I'm aware, <laughs> could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Because each one, each each module's effects should be stack penalized. And if you're doing, um, based on the statistics that they're affecting, right? So I believe uh, that 
if you did two and two, your first one would, uh, we can actually test it, right? So you can say here, scan res, or the uh, targeting range is down to 18.1. And if we just unscript them all, targeting range is 36.9. Yeah, so basically each mod or each statistic, each time a statistic is hit, the stacking penalty applies. So since these are all unscripted and you're hitting both statistics four times, you're getting four levels of stacking penalty on each on scan res and targeting range. Whereas if you script uh, half of them one way and half of them the other way, whoop, you're only getting hit uh, for your first stacking, first level of stacking penalty on each statistic. Is that the same case with uh, local CBOs and tracking computers? Yes. That is, I believe that is the same. Um, I guess I could be wrong about that too. Who knows? Uh, let's see. Module makes your, yeah, it makes your enemy lock up other ships slower and also, or, or, and, or can reduce their targeting, max targeting range. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that's something to note that when you're dealing with modules that do, that use scripts, if you have multiple mo multiple of the same kind of modules, you're always better at you're always better off scripting, uh, splitting scripts as opposed to like unscripting the whole bunch because it's the way stacking penalties work. Uh, so yeah, that's about it for sensor damps there. And there's no um, there's no calculation, right? You apply your full strength within your optimal, and then you know, half strength at the plus fall off and so on, uh, much like damage with turrets and, and such. So um, that's why damps and damps are particularly good because they generally are a pain in the butt to almost every ship in the game. Um, so if you have no idea what you're facing, uh, then bringing damps is a, is a generally a good idea. That's why a lot of like the bigger alliances with, uh, especially like uh, dudes that have a bunch of newbies or lower skilled pilots will throw a bunch of guys in, uh, in molluses or celestuses when they go out on like a, to a crazy fight that they don't know what they're going to be fighting with. They'll just use damps because they're basically every fleet can be messed with using damps. Uh, tracking disruptors, which we'll get to towards the bottom are a little bit different. Moss alpha salt miners, yeah, you spread and it, and they're really strong with very few uh, skill points. Um, so they can basically like they are a, they are a pilot based. The strength of them is based generally on how many pilots you can get, as opposed to like how high of skill those pilots are. Your it's a uh, like your your amount of damps that you can spread is way more important most of the time than the strength of those damps in large scale fleet combat as opposed to small gang where it's more important that you have one really strong uh dampener ship uh so next is stasis grapplers um hmm should we do webs first yeah we'll, we'll skip the list really quick because it's because the stasis grappler is like an evolution of the stasis webifier so uh so we'll skip over we're gonna go stasis webifier these are very simple uh they have a, a an effective range they have a max effective range um, we'll even just use the Celeste. It's got mid slots. We don't really care. Uh, so we throw a web on there. You can see it takes one power grid, like a lot of the CPU based modules do. It takes 25 CPU for the tech one. Uh, it takes a decent amount of cap, not, a, not an insane amount, but a decent amount. Uh, and it has a, a single optimal range, 10 kilometers. Within 10, it works. Outside of 10, it doesn't work. This is an active mid slot module, which means you can overheat it. When you overheat the web, uh, all it does is increase the range, which is very, very important a lot of the time. Um, but it doesn't increase the penalty you apply with the web, which is to reduce the maximum velocity of your opponent. Uh, this doesn't affect things like afterburners, micro warp drives. So whatever the bonus those would get, it's cut in half as well, but they can still function. So, um, you know, your opponent will be slowed by 50% or more, depending on what kind of stuff you, or depending on the uh, different levels here that you have. Uh, but yeah, it's a very simple, very simple concept. Some very powerful ships in the game that get very uh, large bonuses to the range of these things that we will cover when we go over the ships. Uh, but yeah, it's one of the very 
one of the very uh very first modules a lot of people end up using in pvp you got your webs your points and your scrams and we'll go over points and scrams in a bit but yeah your web just reduces whatever their current max speed is it reduces it by 50 percent uh if you go to compact you get a little bit more speed reduction on the enemy and you get better fitting uh you go to enduring you still get the extra speed the fitting is the same but it takes less capacitor you can see here and if we go to the tech 2 it's harder to fit uses the most capacitor um, uh, but it has the highest speed reduction so there you go ever use the eve hq fitting tool i have not i'll have to check it out um so yeah didn't tech one used to be nine kilometers does anyone know I was pretty sure that Tech 2 used to give you a range bonus. I feel like I'm out of the loop. Um, this is one where we will dip and just show that Faction really helps out. So here's Tech 1, here's Tech 2. And in Faction, we have Fed Navy webs, True Chance, True Sancho webs. Uh, you can see here four extra kilometers on a web, five extra kilometers on a web. Very powerful, especially when you have ships that multiply the web range by several times over. Uh, so that four kilometers ends up being like 15 kilometers or something. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll show that more when we do like the web ships. But yeah, web. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the web reduces the ships, uh, the enemy ship's speed to 50% of its maximum. Uh, but it doesn't. So like the if the ship is already going faster than that, it will slow down to that. But for that time period, it will act as though it is at 100% speed. So if a ship is ever trying to escape from you and you hit them with a web first, usually you'll end up causing them to immediately warp. Uh, because like, let's say they're going at 50% of their maximum speed trying to warp out. And then you reduce their maximum speed by 50%. Suddenly the game will function as though they are at 100% speed and that will send them into warp. These apply sp stacking penalties? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Which is also the reason why web drones are generally not a great idea, because each instance reduces the total webbage, and since web drones themselves each only apply a very small speed penalty, uh, generally not worth it. Multiple webs, though, two or three webs on a target uh, is, is totally fine if you need to do it. Uh, but otherwise, like if you're in a big fleet and you have a bunch of webbing ships, usually you'll throw like a web on the Logi Anchor, a web on the enemy FC, slow their fleet down, and then you'll throw one or two webs, excuse me, on the uh, on the primary uh, on the primary target. Yeah, it, there are stacking penalties, but like if you get a bunch of web, if you get like a ton, a ton of webs on you, even with stacking penalties, eventually your speed because because it's getting sliced by a percent every time, so. Eventually, you're going to be not moving very much at all. All right, target spectrum breaker. These are a very interesting module that doesn't see a whole lot of use uh, because of a couple of reasons. So if we go in here, you can only fit these on battleships. Uh, Black Ops or Marauder, those are Tech 2 battleships. And what they do, I don't even know if it's going to show directly, like, what does it even show? I mean, it reduces it reduces your scan resolution. Um seems like just as a general penalty to your ship but otherwise uh, you can activate it once every eight seconds um, but this is more of a let's explain what these crazy things do so it says in here uh, copies the active sweeps of all targeting sensors and reflects them onto other targeters giving their computers the impression that the ship being locked is in two places at once the more target lots active or being attempted against a ship the more conflicting input can be sent to each computer thus increasing the chances that the locks will fail so essentially, oh crap! I forgot grapplers. All right, we'll go back. Uh, we'll go back to the uh, we'll go back to the grapplers in a second. Jeez. Um, but these are basically the way this module is supposed to work is that the more ships that are targeting you or or attempting to target you when you press the button, the more of those locks will be broken as a percentage. So if a hundred people are locking you, there's a higher chance that like so many of them will be uh, broken. But if it's a lower amount of people locking you up then the less chance that a bunch of them will be broken. Um, the reason why these aren't great uh, generally, A is the scan res bonus or penalty, which is like, eh, it's here nor there. But the biggest thing is that um, 
this right here. Uh, and the host ship itself. If you're like an FC that you're trying to use this to survive being locked up and volleyed by an enemy fleet, it also means that a bunch of your lodger are going to lose lock on you, and you might even lose lock on whatever it is you're trying to kill. So, and the percentages, uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't. They're not. As far as I don't, I know that maybe they're written down somewhere, but they're not like in the game attributes uh, are not fantastic. So cool idea, but just the way that it works um, because it's friend or foe, and the fact that it's not super reliable uh, is the uh, is what means or what makes it so that most people don't end up using them uh but they're kind of cute so we'll go back to grapplers yeah a grappler is like the essentially the, an evolution of the web of fire that we just covered a bit ago um they can only be fitted to caps and battleships you see them most often on brawling battleships and um uh, like haw dreads high angle weapon dreads which are like your short range uh good at shooting smaller subcaps uh, for dreads but you can see they can only be fitted to yeah just let's see here you can fit them on uh the caps and the uh you can fit it on the fax do it uh and battleships and the optimal range is very very low 1000 meters but unlike a normal web these guys have a fall off so 10,000 meters so basically uh you have a a very strong very short range optimal web at 85 percent speed penalty uh, but uh, as you leave that optimal you actually have a fall off so the percent speed that you're reduced by will decrease as you uh, get uh, as you draw range or pull range from the ship that's grappling you so they're essentially meant to uh, have a large ship uh, give a large ship uh, the ability to stop people from as effectively getting close and underneath their tracking of like larger, larger turrets. Um, they're pretty good. I've used them. Um, uh, I don't know how successful they've been overall. Um, some people, I guess, who do like a lot of battleship solo PvP can probably say better or a lot of, but like I find on the Hodred that small stuff can still get under your guns if they just stay at a decent, um, if they stay at it, if they stay right side out, right outside of regular web range, um, the, the fall off really hurts your ability to slow them down. So it kind of depends on what you're fighting. Uh, but, but yeah, they're, so they're essentially, you can think of them as a, like an AOE where the, the closer you are to whatever ship has the grappler on you, the slower you're going to go. Uh, and then as you draw away from them, the effectiveness is reduced. As opposed to regular web of fire where there's a static amount of slowness with a hard cutoff uh, at the distance they stop working. Uh, and oh, we can put it on Nidhogger and see. Uh, and then if you overheat it, you get more optimal um, but not more fall off. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, you get three times the optimal, but no more fall off. Did I say it's AOE? Oh, it's not an. It's it's targeted. Um, it's it's a targeted module, mid slot module. But you can think of how it affects you in a radius around the ship that's using it on you. So as you pull range, it gets less effective. Uh, all right, so we'll go on to target painters here now. Uh, let's pull up a, uh, oh God, bellicose, I guess. <sighs> no fits. Bellicoses aren't really used too much. Um, so the target painter is a, an active mid slot module, much like most of the other ACM here. Be a lot cooler if it was, eh, yeah, yeah, maybe, um, Target painters do one thing. They increase the signature radius of the ship that you're shooting. There it is. This is the modifier. Uh, if you overheat it, you get m even more signature radius increase. Why would you want to increase the signature radius of an enemy ship, you ask? Uh, it makes them take more damage from bombs. It makes them, take, uh, it makes them easier to hit with turrets. It makes them easier to apply damage to or take more damage from missiles in a lot of cases. Uh, it makes them faster to lock target on. Signature radius does all of these things. Uh, 
yeah, these the meta levels of these things used to have some real uh, silly, real silly names. You had a uh, pwn. Or does it not list the? Oh yeah, it does. So you had pwn. You had pwned. And then you had Pwnage. These used to be the names Phased Weapon Navigation Array Generation Extron Pwnage. Uh, yeah, thankfully. Sorry. There are some memers who like those names, but I thought they were super cringeworthy. Um, but yeah, so basically, usually you're going to see these on a bunch of vigils, occasionally on uh, like Hugans. Bellicoses are kind of too easy to kill. To really be worth bringing in as opposed to something that does a little bit more um but yeah target painters very useful they do they do have the stacking penalty problem so you wouldn't want to bring like 50 vigils with target painters it's not going to do anything for you as opposed to like so if you had like 50 e-war that you wanted to bring to a fight i'd probably say like bring eight vigils and then the rest molluses um yeah it's very simple how it works Again, very easy to get into with low SP and be very helpful. Um, but you, you don't want to bring too many of them is the only thing. Uh, and then we have, oh, what are these? Warp Disruption Field Generators. These are your uh, heavy interdictor bubble generators. We'll cover these in detail when we do the heavy interdictor. Uh, because that's the only ship they work on. And there's yeah, there's more to it than just seeing what does the module do. Essentially, you can you can either make a bubble or you can do a really hard uh, target tackle on a target. But when we cover heavy interdictors, we'll go over what these do in detail. Uh, warp disruptors are your what we would call a long point or just a point. Uh, they stop a ship from warping. So if we put one on here, let's see. You can open up the module stats. You got. Uh, Optimal range, so it's your maximum range of 24 kilometers. If you overheat, you can get increased range. This is another active mid slot. So if we overheat it, it goes up to 28.8 kilometers. Uh, some of the faction ones have a longer range. For instance, uh, what is it? Uh, fleet that people like to use? I mean, it depends on different, different uh, factions have different ranges, different uh, bonuses. True Sancha ends up being one of the... Uh, Longest ones, uh, True Sancha and Republic Fleet are kind of similar. So if you overheat one of these, you get even more bonus because it's percentage based. Uh, and the reason why people call these a point is because, where is it in our list here? Warp Scramble Strength. One point of Warp Scramble Strength. Now as long as you have more points of Warp Scramble Strength, uh, then the enemy has uh points of warp core stability then they can't warp so by default all you need is one point because most ships don't have any innate warp core stability uh, but if they start adding modules like warp core stabilizers which will cover probably what down in propulsion or somewhere uh, or if they are in a ship like a venture that has inbuilt warp core stability then you might need more points than just this one another example is super capitals uh, they come with a default amount of warp core stability. I think it's like 24, something like that. Um, we can check real quick. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to look up the Aeon because it won't get any use anywhere else. Uh, okay, per level you get five. Uh, so depending on your mark carrier, it's either 20 or 25, I think. Uh, unless there's like some... I'm sure some uh, dank super capital pilot was that a shot on the aeon you bet it was you bet it was buddy all right so yeah basically uh they have a long range they stop the ship from warping but they do nothing else they only have one point of warp uh warp uh scramble power so if your enemy even has a single warp core stabilizer or isn't a ship that has some warp core strength they're not going to be very good however they are lo much longer range than scramblers so uh these are generally going to be your like initial tackle, your initial point. Now, they don't turn off any of the enemy prop mods or anything like that, so generally you want to follow up with what we call a warp scrambler. And we can throw that on here. Uh, there also are heavy warp disruptors. Um, 
which you would fit on capitals because of the oh that doesn't even let you yeah i think it the the fitting is such that you're not fitting on anything that's not a capital but uh you see these ones have three points of scram strength which is cool so if you have if you have them on a cap um yeah, and they do stack. Elite Force is correct. So if you have 25 people with uh, warp disruptors, uh, they can stop a super capital from warping. Or 13 and a half, 12 and a half, 12 and a half people with uh, warp scramblers. Um, but the heavy ones, generally, you're going to fit them on caps, and they have more points of strength. Uh, so yes, the scrambler, as uh, as you can see, it has a much shorter range. Uh, again, these are these are basically like it works out to the optimal and then it doesn't work anymore. So much much shorter range. However, they have two points of warp score, warp core, or sorry, warp scramble strength, and the additional, very important, uh, attribute of disabling uh, micro warp drives and micro jump drives. So if a ship is scrammed, it cannot use a micro warp drive to go very fast and get away from you, and it cannot use a micro jump drive to jump away from you. Uh, this also stops anyone who is scrammed also cannot be micro jumped by a command destroyer, which again we'll cover in a, in a later episode. Um, but command destroyers in brief are a ship that create like a spherical field around them, after which after a certain amount of time, every ship in that field is moved in a direction 100 kilometers if a ship in that field is scrammed it does not move the rest of the ships will go and it will stay put uh, if the ship operating that micro warp field generator is scrammed then nobody moves including the ship and um, the same goes for single or, or uh, regular micro jump drives if you get scrammed if you are scrammed you can't activate it and if you uh, have activated it and you get scrammed uh, then you can't uh, then you won't go anywhere and it will it'll just be nothing uh, why in wormholes you normally go with dual scrams because everyone loves warp, uh, warp stabs in wormhole space, yeah, and also ventures and stuff. Uh, but yeah, so scrams, if you overheat them, turn another active mid slot module, you overheat that, you get a little bit of extra range since the default range is so short, your overheat isn't no, it doesn't send it too far, but it can be the difference between life and death, especially if you're using the warp scrambler as what we call a defensive scram where you're trying to stop an enemy ship from using its micro warp drive to approach you quickly. If you overheat it uh, and increase your range a slight amount, could be the difference between them getting close enough to scram or web you and slow you down if you're trying to run away uh, or not. So always keep that in mind. Uh, and yes, there are there is a concept called scram chaining, where if you're in a fleet of ships and you're all warp scrambling each other on purpose to try to stop enemies from being able to move you with those command destroyer fields, the only issue with that is that a lot of those command destroyers have started to fit um, burst jammers. So they land, they all fire their burst jammers, half of your fleet loses lock on the other half, half your fleet gets moved and half doesn't. It's a It's a whole thing, so... Uh, scram chaining went in and then out of fashion very quickly. Uh, and then there are also heavy scrams, which again, generally you're going to fit on caps. And they have, you know, six points instead of uh, two, whereas the heavy disruptors have uh, three points instead of one. So multiplies it by three. They do the same thing where they stop the, you know, micro warps, uh, drives, and so on uh, as well. But you'll a lot of times see if uh, if dudes are like hunting a super, um, and they drop a little dread bomb on it, then all those dreads could have like heavy scrams just to stop it from getting away. Ooh. All right, uh, weapon disruptor. So this is the last one. These are arguably uh, what's it? Crucifier. Arguably the best. Electronic warfare for a couple of reasons. One, the ships that use them tend to get, uh, especially the Tech One frigate, gets a huge range bonus to these things, um, and uh, their their effects are very powerful. Uh, the only problem is wait. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the only problem is that there are two different types of weapon disruptors. There are guidance disruptors, which affect enemy missile systems, and there are tracking disruptors, 
which affect enemy turret systems. So turrets are going to be your lasers, your hybrid uh, weapons, uh, your projectile weapons, uh, and then your missiles are going to be your missiles. I mean, your rockets, your light missiles, your heavy missiles, your, your uh, torpedoes, cruise missiles, etc. Uh, so if we look at, for example, this cruise fire, uh, and we take a look at the module stats, you can see in the description, it affects the range and tracking speed. So these are tracking disruptors, active mid slot module. If you overheat them, you get extra power uh, to the effect. The range stays the same and they affect the optimal range and or the tracking speed of the turrets. So you can fill these with scripts, optimal range, uh, and you get, you know, twice the power, but only to the one stat. You can do it with tracking speed. It's the same deal. Uh, and these are really, really good, really, really good. So let's change these. Let's say all of these we're going to go to uh, optimal range, right? So we have the standard tech one. This thing is worth. This thing is less than a million isk. This isn't all fives character, but we'll just leave it for the time being because this the skills are, you know. Um, and then if we open up, uh, what are we going to do? Open up the eagle. I'm going to reveal the eagle fit <laughs> the same eagle fit that everyone is most likely using uh so if we go to an eagle and we're like hey look at this uh look at this eagle here with the spike shoots out to 160 kilometers optimal it's crazy it's crazy but what if we open the fitting browser here and we go to projected and we go like this oh baby Oh baby, 40 kilometers with spike ammo, which means if they were shooting antimatter, oh boy, oh boy, 12 kilometers, not so great for an eagle. And that's one single uh, crucifier with stacking penalties. If we just do, like, let's say this crucifier was was uh, in a fleet fighting against a bunch of eagles, right? Uh, and it only did uh, one tracking disruptor per enemy. You know, this single eagle say again we're fighting a spike range goes from 160 kilometers to 92 kilometers and he can do that to three separate eagles that's pretty powerful that's pretty good for a uh now obviously some of these skills may maybe not be level five on like a new player but the, the concept still applies it's a really powerful bonus um and it can and the crucifier in particular has a really long range so it can sit way out where you can do nothing to it essentially uh, again the only weakness is that if you wanted to do the same thing to a missile ship you need a different module it's not just a different script it's a completely different module uh, and if we throw some of these on here instead let's do some guidance disruptors so generally the statistics are pretty similar in terms of like uh fitting and um uh and and the uh actually the power the effect power is a little bit lower but probably because of the statistics you're working on but instead of optimal range and uh and who maybe tracking speed you were looking at missile range and missile application the reason uh i say missile application is because here it is model stats uh, it affects a couple of different things. So it affects explosion radius. Oh, this one is the is the range. So for range, it affects flight speed or missile speed and flight time. Where are they? They're in this list here somewhere. There we go. Flight time bonus. So it reduces the time that they're in flight, uh, and it reduces uh, the speed. Where is it? I'm sure it's somewhere here. Missile velocity. There it is. The range of a missile is calculated by the game uh, as as basically the game knows how long the missile um, will be in the, in flight and how fast the missile is. And that's how it calculates the range. So if you reduce how fast the missile is, it will uh, expire before it reaches its target. And if you reduce the flight time, again, it will uh, it will expire shorter on its flight. So... That's how that's how the range reduction works in terms of the missiles. Uh, when you are reducing the missiles, like equivalent to tracking, this is like application. Uh, it's called the missile precision disruption script. Uh, and if we look at that, then it's affecting explosion radius and explosion velocity. Two statistics that are used when the game calculates how much damage you take uh, from a missile that hits you. Missiles can't 
uh, hit or miss. They always hit you. The damage that you take, if you're within range, that is. Uh, the damage that you take is calculated based on your speed, your signature radius, versus the explosion radius and explosion velocity of uh, the missile that's fired upon you. So when you use this guidance disruptor on an enemy missile ship, if you uh, use these missile dis uh, precision disruption scripts, it means that the enemy missiles uh, apply less damage to the things that they hit, or depending on what they're shooting, could apply less damage. Uh, and then the range is the same. It reduces their range by way of making their missiles slower and uh, last uh, and expire sooner when they're in flight. Always wanted a tracking guidance computer disruptor similar to those dual we analyzers we could do both. Yeah, if you don't know what you're up against, it's really hard, man. That's the thing that makes that's the that's the counterbalance to how powerful these modules are is that you have to pick um, either that or you carry some in your cargo and you can refit if if there's friendly uh, refitting around, either a cap or somewhere you can dock and refit or a uh, a nester. Um, rest in peace. Asher's Nestor, never forget. Uh, yeah, Lelob used to used to cart a Nestor around with his e war fleets for, for this very thing. Um, luckily, if you know what you're going to be facing, or at least you know the doctrines of the enemy, and they have, you know, like for instance, when we uh, when we fight Snuff, um, generally we know that they're going to be using turrets of some variety. Um, you know, most likely nightmares or sometimes eagles and things like this. Um, so you can pick, but if you don't know or if the enemy has multiple doctrines that use missiles or uh, use turrets, then it becomes a lot harder to do. And in that case, you might be better off bringing molluscs instead. All right. So that's all, that's all we have for electronic warfare. Um, we're going to call it there for now. Uh, I'm going to step away for about 60 seconds here. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the stuff that we covered in drone upgrades or electronic warfare, feel free to leave them in the chat. Do at Averin so I see them. I will be right back. All right. Pap, no paps today. Sorry, friends. Um, what's the best e worship in the game and why is it the Celestis? My man, I think it's the Crucifier. Pretty sure it's the Crucifier, unless you count webs and stuff as e war, in which case, uh, obviously, the Hugin. Um, but pound for pound, the Crucifier is ridiculous. For what it costs and how many skills you need to fly it, it is insane. Absolutely insane. Um, man, this is gonna be a long series, isn't it? <laughs> two hours and we got <laughs> we got not two hours, an hour and a half and we got through drone upgrades and <laughs> electronic warfare. My god, what have I gotten myself into? E war and tackling should be divided into different groups. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And Griffin is pretty good. People get really upset about ECM because uh, there's nothing you can, like, A, it's a die roll, so sometimes uh, it works when you feel it really shouldn't. It's like when you miss the 99% shot in XCOM. Um, 
but also because when it happens to you, like you can't do, you can't lock any targets. You can't do anything. You're just like, well, I, well, you just step away from the computer. You might as well go make some coffee or something. There's nothing you can do. Terrible. Oh my God. He's got an ECM emote. To me, what's up, dude? All right. So I think that's, uh, that's going to do it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cut out and, uh, I think, uh, rain might be streaming tonight on this channel. Um, uh, why should you weren't tackling cap warfare be in divided groups? Yeah, that's true. All those modules are like, make your enemy upset <laughs> instead of killing them. <laughs> instead of killing them, make them upset. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, if you enjoyed your time here, uh, I just did the thing in chat. That's my channel. Uh, if you haven't been by, feel free to throw me a follow. Uh, I do lectures like this sometimes. We do fleet sometimes. Uh, I commentate over big fights if I hear about them. I go spectate, commentate, um, all sorts of fun stuff. I do kind of whatever I feel like, uh, you know. So if you got ideas, you can uh, join that channel. If you type exclamation point discord in my Twitch chat on my channel, you get a link to my discord. Uh, and yeah, so thanks for stopping by, friends. Uh Thanks, uh, thanks for the cameo, Asher. I don't know if he's still here. And, uh, and yeah, I appreciate it. So, uh, like I always say, be safe, be kind, love each other. And we'll see you guys next time. Ta-ta.